Well, it's that time again, everybody. It's um, 6.32, actually. I was going to say it's 6.30, but it's 6.32. And here we are again, streaming from my house in Burpengary. And I trust you're going to have a great night tonight. So let's, um, before we start, let's, why don't we pray and ask uh, God to help us with this night. Dear God, I just pray tonight that you will uh, give us clarity of mind and understanding to hear the words that you're going to speak to us. Lord, I pray that it will be a challenge to all of our hearts, even my heart, as I bring this sermon. Lord, I pray that many people will be watching this tonight, be encouraged and be blessed. And I pray, Lord God, that people will um, just look at the words that are spoken and think about them. Sometimes we hear so many sermons that we don't really consider the life application. But, Lord, I pray tonight we you speak into every person's heart. Lord, this is the message of uh, hope and it's an important message to hear for our lives, and we all need this kind of message. So, Lord, I pray tonight that your anointing come upon the word. Uh, bless me as I release this word tonight, and, and let the listeners who are listening to it be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I have my trusty Kerry sitting on the lounge. She's checking to see if my feed's working. She's giving me the big thumbs up. So, yes, technology, it's a wonderful thing, and it's working. So. Praise God. So let me get my iPad and we'll kick straight off with tonight's sermon. Here we go. So tonight's sermon, what I've titled this sermon is, We Are Who God Says We Are. Let me just repeat that in case you've got a short-term memory like I have. Sometimes they call it a goldfish memory. So we are who God says we are. And that's why it's so important. I believe for people to hear this message because so many people don't know what God is saying they are like. They haven't heard what God says about them. And you know, what God says about us is a wonderful message of hope and joy and strength and peace, a word that encourages and blesses us so much that it's so good to know what God thinks about us and who God says we are. Tonight, I want to. Um, Look at a, a story, a well-known story from the book of uh, from the story from the book of Judges. Uh, I'm going to talk about Gideon tonight, and um, I nearly said we're going to look at the book of Gideon. I and mean, there's no such book as of Gideon. You have to be uh, patient with me at times because I'm a bit crazy, as you probably have got used to by now. Sometimes I get my words mixed up or my people mixed up. It's not an uncom uncommon problem for me. But never mind, I'm having fun and I hope you're having fun. Be relaxed and be blessed tonight as we continue. So uh, just for information only, the book of Judges, it's an Old Testament book and it's actually called the historic uh, teachings or the historic, uh, historic history of the nation of Israel. It was uh, written during the Babylon exile and the Judges uh, is about the people who were called to be charismatic leaders to deliver Israel from a succession of foreign domination. So as the title of the, the book is Judges, it's talking about charismatic leaders who became the judge, became God's judge to bring deliverance to the people of Israel. So I want to read a quote to you. Uh, it's not kind of my words and not the way I would really think and process my thoughts with these words, but it's such a good uh, quote that I, I want to tell it to you and I hope I don't mess it up because it's not my kind of thinking, but it's so good. It says here, we are not the mistakes that threaten to define us, but the biblical truth that proves our actual worth. We are created by love to love as we walk with love. We exist to make his name known. 
His desire is to walk with us along the way, blessing us and fill our lives with more than we can ask for or imagine. Only by drawing close to him with a life prioritized to put him first, will we witness the layers of who we are as he sees us. Isn't that incredible? That God wants to be part of our life. He wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. It's a life of love and loving relationships. And as we draw close to him and, and put all of our heart and all of our life into his hands and make him a number one priority in our life, it says here, we will witness the layers of who we are. And, you know, I'm getting old now and I've discovered that there are many layers in people's lives of who the real person is. And sometimes we never get to find the real people because of the multitudes of layers that are put on top of people. People hide uh, so much with a whole heap of layers blocking their true potential or, or covering up hurts and sorrows. But, you know, when we walk with Christ, he peels back the layers of our lives. To, to bring out what he sees us as already. See, God has a different idea to us than we see. God has a greater idea of who we are than what we could ever imagine. And so I just really love that, that quote tonight, and I, I trust you get hold of that tonight. It's about a living relationship with God. And as we live and as we walk with him, uh, we discover layer by layer, we discover who we really are in God and what God has for us and who he wants us to be like. I'm going to uh, read uh, from the Judges chapter 6, and it's a really well-known story tonight, uh, very well-known, and it's about the story of Gideon. And it's kind of a favourite of mine, and I, I really enjoy preaching about Gideon. Uh, it's an easy story, and most of us have heard it many times. I'm sure you've heard it at Sunday school as a child. Maybe you've heard it uh, in, you know, as a primary, primary age person, you've heard the story of Gideon. Um, I'm hoping my granddaughter who listens to my preaching, I hope that she's um, heard the story of Gideon. If not, she'll listen to a little bit of that tonight. But I want to talk about this story of Gideon. So it's in Judges chapter 6. But I'm not going to read all of the story because it's not that absolutely completeness of what my sermon is about tonight. So I'm just going to pick it up in chapter 11. So it's Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in opera that belonged to Josh, Joash. I'm not going to say what who he was because I can't pronounce it. So Joash, where his son Gideon was fresh in wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. You know, already, as I start to read these words, my mind is just doing crazy imaginative things about the story that's being unfolded. Here is Gideon hiding in a wine press. A wine press, if you're not a farmer, a wine press is a place where you make wine. It's not a place where you fresh wheat. Normally, freshing of wheat was done out in the open in the fields near to the harvest. And so already we can see there's an issue going on in this story. Something is not quite right with this idea that Gideon is basically frightened and hiding in a wine press, uh, freshing out the wheat to give to his family, to give to his friends, his community, to provide bread or substance for them. Uh, and he was frightened because the Midianites had, had kept raiding the properties and raiding the land and stealing their, their harvests, and so he was trying to hide a harvest for, his, for himself and for his family. And in verse 12, it says this, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I love it. I just love the Bible, how it writes things. You know? Here is a man frightened to death, uh, freshing out wheat in an unusual place, and uh, the angel of the Lord comes and says, uh, mighty warrior, mighty warrior. Gideon, you are a mighty warrior. In verse 13, it continues, uh, Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? 
But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midian. I, I like again this translation. And, um, you know, here is this angel of the Lord, a heavenly visitation, a quite amazing visitation. I've never had one, but I'm sure I'd be like shocked to the roots to have this kind of situation take place. So this angel comes to, to uh, Gideon and says, mighty warrior. And Gideon says, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me indeed. I'd be going, what are you talking about, angel? No, pardon me. Are you a crazy angel? Don't you have the right understanding of who I am? And he goes on to say, you know, God has abandoned us. You see, Gideon was not a mighty warrior. His faith was failing. He, he was wondering if God had abandoned them and was wondering why they were in this trouble. In verse 14, it says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So the Lord didn't even listen to um, his reply, didn't even really take up his complaint. He just said, go in the strength you have. You see, God already could see in this frightened man, this man with no faith, God could already see potential in this person. He could already see that he was indeed a mighty warrior. And within him, within himself, there was a strength that Gideon didn't know he had. Because he goes on to he goes on and says, go in the strength you have. And I'm sure by this time, Gideon is going, what strength do I have? Here I am hiding away from the enemy, frightened that they will take the very last bit of um, wheat that I'm trying to get together to feed my family. You know, what strength do I have? But you see, God sees us in a different way. Again, politely as possible, Gideon says, pardon me, pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. If I haven't pronounced that properly, well, I'm not Jewish, so please forgive me. Again, Gideon goes, are you crazy? Are you crazy? What strength do I have that I could go and save Israel? What, what are you doing, angel? Have you gone to the wrong man? Did God tell you to go to some great person, but you stopped at my place and you've got the wrong person? You know, how can I save Israel? I don't have any strength. In fact, my family is the weakest in all of the Israel. My family is the weakest. And not only is my family the weakest, I am the least in my family. Now, Gideon thought he was absolutely worthless and had no ability and had no strength. But the Lord says to him, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. You see, again, the Lord, the angel of the Lord, didn't respond to his negative confession, didn't chastise him about, oh, don't be down on yourself, young man. I've got plans for you. You know, he didn't do that. All he did is said, I'll be with you and you will strike down the Midianites. You will strike down your enemy and you are going to have victory and you're going to lead Israel into freedom. So in this story tonight, we see how God wanted to show Gideon that the person God, that he was the person God said he was, a mighty warrior. As the story and we see how God reduced the number of people who would fight so Gideon would realize for himself who he was and more importantly who God was, who his God was. See there's lessons in this story as we start to look at it, there's lessons that we can start to apply to our own lives. You see God always saw Gideon as a mighty warrior. Even though he, in his own sight, he saw him as the weakest, the foolish, the, the scaredest, whatever, the person that could never rise up to a task or a, a, an opportunity, a person who was always thinking, I'm the very least of my family, you know, everybody above me, my sisters and brothers and everybody else, and they're all better than me, and woe is me, I'm no good, and you know. But God didn't see that. God 
continued with this whole thing, mighty warrior, mighty warrior. And you know, Gideon, I believe, had a, came to an understanding of who he was in God. But more importantly than just who he was in God, he came to an understanding who God was and what God could do. And when he was working with God, that he could do all the things that God told him would come to pass. If, again, my, my mind starts to spin out into some kind of crazy land. But um, Gideon's been having this conversation with the angel of the Lord. Now, I've been reading about this angel of the Lord, and uh, there's lots of deep theology about this angel. Uh, and some say he was this person, and some say he was that person. Other religions say he was this person and that person. You know, every, every religion's got a, a different idea who the angel of the Lord was. Uh, when I went to Bible school, I'm pretty sure that we kind of said that this angel of the Lord was um, was Jesus before he became Jesus. Now, I forget the big word they used, but basically they were saying he was Jesus uh, coming as the angel of the Lord to him. But, you know, Gideon has been having this conversation with this supernatural being. And, and this supernatural event was taking place, which would have been quite amazing. And yet... It's quite a, a few questions go backwards and forwards before Gideon realizes he's seen the Lord. See, we were looking at what were we looking at? Verses 13 uh, and 15 when he's talking to this angel. And then as we read through the story, it's in verse 22 and verse 23, the Bible tells us that Gideon realizes he's seen the Lord. It's like, do you? Dumb or you? What are you? Slow? You know, you've taken quite a bit of conversation to realize that this person you're talking to is actually the Lord. Yet, despite this, in, in, despite this incredible uh, encounter with a supernatural being who told him that he was going to be a mighty hero and was going to rescue the Israelites from their trouble and from the enemies that were going against them and robbing them and causing them so much grief that he was going to be the man that would bring them into victory. And, and yet having this encounter and having this word from God, which was so powerful, uh, he still doubts himself and still, and still doubts whether he could really be the person called to save Israel. Now, I like, I like these people in the Bible because they're painted as who they are. And it makes me feel good and I feel, well, if they're like that, perhaps I'm not so bad myself. You see, they're not perfect people, but God doesn't choose to use perfect people. And that's the mystery of God. In verse um, 36 to 38, Gideon tests God with this idea of wet wool. You know, God, if I leave this wool, um, then in the morning I want the wool to be wet but the ground to be dry. Okay, he has this discussion with God again, and the next morning he wakes up and the, the wool is wet and the ground's dry. He goes, wow, you know, amazing, amazing. And then he goes, oh, hang on, maybe it still wasn't God. Maybe I didn't really hear from God that I was going to be the, the, the deliverer of Israel. So I'll ask again, another test. And the second test is in uh, verses 39 and 40. And this time, instead of the wool being wet, he wants the wool to be dry and the ground to be wet. And so overnight, this incredible situation comes about and he wakes up in the morning, he races down to his wool pile and he looks at it. And yes, amazingly enough, this time that the wool was dry and the ground was wet. This is twice he's tested the Lord. I don't know if I'd be game to test the Lord in case he's, you know, he struck me dead or burnt me to a little ash pile going, Boop, you know. But here is Gideon testing the Lord to see if he really was the Lord, so he could trust in uh, what he told him. Anyway, after this experience, Gideon finally at last is satisfied that he's heard from God and he starts to raise an army to fight against the Midianites. At last, Gideon is on his way uh, to becoming this mighty warrior that God had already seen he was and had the capacity and the inner strength to do what God had called him to do. You see, God never gives us a task to do without enabling us to do it. It wouldn't be fair to God 
of God to choose something too difficult that we would fail in. God wants us to to have victory. He doesn't want us to fail. And what God asks us to do, even though at times it will stretch us incredibly stretched, God still gives us his ability and his anointing to do the things that he calls us to do. And same with Gideon. There was an inner strength in Gideon, and, you know, really it was put in there by the God, by God and the grace of God. So, you know, as we read on, we read um, in Judges chapter 7 and, and verses 2 to 8, we, we look at the story where uh, God reduces the number of, of men, the, the soldiers. He reduces the number down to 300. You see, they had quite a large army amassed, but it was still only a small army comparison to the Medianites. Um, but yet again, God didn't want them to trust in their own strength and themselves. So he wanted to um, to bring the army down to a smaller number. And and he brought the, the number of these people down to 300 to prove to Gideon that, that through God's help, Gideon was going to have victory. It was going to be a supernatural thing. It wasn't going to be a, a natural thing. It was going to be an awesome supernatural event. And God had told him he would have victory. God had already told him that horrible thing before where he said there wouldn't be any alive. He'd kill them all. So like, well, I'm glad I don't live in the Old Testament. I don't like all that killing and stuff. Anyway, there was a great victory. There was a great victory. Read the story if you want all the facts. There was a great victory because God was on Gideon's side and he, and he led uh, the soldiers in the battle and won the victory. Now, no longer would Gideon uh, call himself the weakest kid on the block. Or as the Bible puts it, I am the least in my family. We would say today that the weakest kid on the block, you know, the kid that just has no belief in himself, no confidence in himself, and he's always putting himself down. But, you know, after this victory, there was a, there was a strength that arose and there was strength within before the victory of the battle too. And you, as you read through the scriptures here of this account, he did some great and wonderful things that challenged the very society that he lived in because he'd heard from God. Gideon was filled with a true sense of who he was. Gideon starts to get an understanding of who he was because God had spoken it into his life, because God had peeled back the layers of who he thought he was and shown him who he was really deep inside. And because of this, he had a true sense of who he was now as a leader. And so he could now begin to re re reach the potential in his life and, and have success in his life because of this situation. Now, so many times we listen to, to what people say about us and not what God says. You know, what do you think about yourself? Are you the least? <laughs> Are you down on yourself? Do you think you can't amount to much? You know, what do you think about yourself? So many times we listen to what people say about us. People have always got an opinion about you. People are always willing to put you down. In Australia, it's called the tall poppy syndrome. And you're not allowed to, to rise up or be different or be unusual or succeed because the, the, the most of the people want to keep you at their same level. And, um, you know, it, people always put you down. But we need to find out what God says about us and what our true potential is in God. You see, we miss out on so much because we underestimate who we are and what we can do. Let me tell you that again. We miss out on so much because we, we ourselves, we underestimate, underestimate, that's a new word. It is a mess. We underestimate who we are and what we can do. Kerry's laughing. She's always laughing at me. The world is quick to tell us that we're no good and can amount to nothing. And I'm sure all of us experienced that in our lives at times where we felt that, you know, you know, people have put us down and, and have, have not encouraged us to rise up and, and perhaps haven't really helped us to find out who we are and where we're going in life. And, you know, and they're very quick to do this. But God has a different idea about us. And I'm so pleased tonight to tell you that God has a, a different idea about who we are. And it's not what we think. 
I remember when I was called to missions many years ago as a teenager, I felt the call of God. Uh, and both me and Kerry had a, a, a strong sense of the a call to missions uh, as we were teenagers and growing up. And as we were getting older and having children, we had a strong desire to be missionaries. And I was always looking to serve God overseas in a practical way. After all, I was just a storeman. I was just a common, normal worker. And all I could do was some kind of labor. That's all I had in my mind. I could go and you know, help an orphanage. I could go and help this place or do that place. But it's always thinking about manual, just manual labor, you know, just going over there and serving them and helping them. That was my understanding. That was my idea of what missions would be for me and Kerry. But, you know, God had other plans for me. God had a different idea to what he saw in me than what I saw in myself. And, you know, I, I didn't have the the, all the confidence and I didn't think I was, uh, you know, the, the best at this or that, uh, but I knew I could work and I was happy to go and work for the Lord. Even in that way, I was happy to go. I felt the call of God and I wanted to do something. But God had other plans for me. You know, I never expected to be traveling the world and preaching and praying and seeing God's anointing touching people's lives. I never imagined that, that I could possibly be in that situation praying and preaching and prophesying and laying hands on people and, and seeing people fall to the ground under the Holy Spirit or laughing or healed or set free and touching their hearts and emotions and seeing the tears. You know, I never ever imagined, it was not in my imagination that I could possibly be this kind of person. I just thought all I would be is like a lowly worker just doing some sort of labouring job. You know, after all, I, in my sight, I was an uneducated manual worker. That's all I was in my own sight. But that is exactly what happened to me. I did go overseas and I did become this person who preached and prophesied and prayed and, and had wonderful supernatural encounters with people's lives. I became that person. It's exactly what happened because God had a much bigger picture for my life than I ever thought possible. Let me pause for a quick moment. What do you think about your life? Are you just, oh, I'm just Joe Average, Susan Average, Mary Average, George Average. Maybe I'm just average. I'll never amount to much, you know. There's all reasons why we don't amount to much. Oh, I didn't go to school. I didn't get the opportunities, or I couldn't get an apprenticeship, and I wasn't clever enough to do this, and I wasn't good enough to do that. And, you know, I'm just an average Joe Blow. And so, so many of us go through life just believing that kind of thing, that we're just average, just an average person. But, you know, when you become a Christian, when you give your life to God, God has a plan and a purpose for your life that will blow you away. And you are no longer ordinary. You are no longer ordinary because you are now supernatural. We are supernatural beings and God has an incredible plan for our lives. And we've got to get beyond ourselves and we've got to start to see what God sees of us, what God thinks about us and, and what God sees in our lives and the potential that we have in our lives. You know, all of us are born with gifts and talents, all of us. Uh, some are natural and some are God-given, but all of us have something that we can use to do incredible, extraordinary things. Everyone has a capacity within them to do something wonderful because we are created in God's image. And so we are all we all have inside of us some way of being creative and expressing the creativity in our lives. And I want to tell you, when we start to tap into what God says we are and what God has plans for us to do, when we start to get into those sorts of things, we will see our life changing and we will see our lives going in a different place to a place we never expected before. And, you know, I just look back on my life and I think, you know, wow, I was 14 and a half roughly when I left England and came to Australia. And I often think back, if I'd have just stayed in England, where would my life have gone to? 
I, I don't know. In my mind, I think it would have been rubbish. It was beginning rubbish at, the, at that age, and it probably would have continued to be rubbish with the situation over in England at that time. And, you know, I'm so pleased that God took me out of that place and brought me to Australia and gave me a new, a new land and a new destiny, a new purpose. And I'm so glad that I'm a Christian and have loved God and served God, and he has walked with me and unpeeled the layers of my life and, and started to, to bring out my giftings and my talents and, and start to anoint my life and bless me and bless my life so I can be a blessing to other people. And it's nothing to do with me. And I, I just feel so privileged that God, he had the plan. It was his purpose because he saw the picture. He saw what I could be even when I wasn't. You know, when I was a, a crazy young teenager on a motorbike racing around the streets of Brisbane uh, on drugs and, and speed on my motorbike, you know, that was my picture that I painted for my life at that time. And, you know, in, in my thoughts at those times, my greatest dream was to smash my bike and be engulfed in flames and die. That was my desire of life at that time, to go out in glory, you know. But praise God, he had a different picture for my life, a much more wonderful picture than that. I want to give you some scriptures tonight to finish off with. I want to give you some scriptures that just talk about what God sees us as and what we would look like if we just give our lives completely to God and make him the first priority in our lives. So I want to get, leave you with some scriptures tonight. If you need to hear these scriptures, then just, you know, perhaps go back onto this video later and just start to, to write the scriptures down and, to, and start to read on these scriptures and let the word of God start to come into your heart and start to come into your spirit and start let God start to write the picture that he sees you are. Let's put down the false impressions of and uh, uh, excuses that we make, you know, uh, Gideon had so many reasons why he couldn't do what God wanted him to do and he couldn't see himself being the mighty warrior because he was just the nobody. You know, we can all be in that situation at times. In fact, a lot of us have been through those situations and, and come out the other side. And I want to tell you, uh, I'm living proof that it's possible that God wrote a different picture to my life than the picture that I wrote for myself. And it's been a life of most wonderful blessing. So here's some scriptures tonight. Let's, let's read them and meditate upon them. And let's start to get the image of what God thinks about us. The first one is in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. It says, Do not, con do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing and perfect will. You see, straight away, God wants the best for us. It's pleasing and it's perfect. And it's saying here, don't let the world tell you what you should be like. Don't, let, don't listen to them. Don't copy them. Don't copy what their styles are. Don't. You know, don't do what they do. Don't think like they think, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the best way to, re to transform and to renew our mind is to listen to the word of God and let the word of God, let God speak his truth into our lives so we can refashion and remold our thinking behavior and our even correct our wrong thinking and break habits of wrong thinking and take away, you know, uh, rubbish thinking and put in positive thinking into our lives. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5, it says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love and with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, blinded by the enemy, because of God's love, because of his mercy, because of his grace, he saw you in a different light. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 
chapter 7 and verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is a faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. God's trustworthy and faithful. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, when we start to get the picture that God loves us, that's, his, that's what he sees when he looks at us. He sees someone that he can love, someone he can nurture, someone he can change, someone he can give hope to, some, somebody he can uh, give possibility to. God looks at, at every person with love. And when we know we are loved by God, wow. Well, we can go through all things when we know we are loved by God. Even this virus is going around. It, when we're loved by God, we can, we can grow even through these difficult times. In Jeremiah verse 1 and verse 5, chapter 1 and verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Imagine that. We go, oh, I'm nobody. I'm the least of my clan. I'm the dumbest kid on the block. You know, my parents did this and this happened and I didn't go to that good school. And, and God says, no, bef before I formed you in the womb, before you were even thought about, before you happened, you were set apart. God set you apart because he had a purpose and a plan for your life. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession. I love that. I love it. We are God's special possession. Who feels worthless at times, hopeless at times, useless at times? You're not. You are God's special possession. You're his diamond, the apple of his eye, the one that he loves so much that he sent Christ to die so you could live. You're God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. In 1 John, in 1 John verse 3, so see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. We are children of God. And he lavishes his love on us. Well, that's a pretty extreme word, lavish. That means to go over and beyond the call of duty. It's like, it's just like pouring out, pouring out the gifts and affection and the love and you know, it's like if you, you know, you're on, on your first date with your girlfriend and um, instead of just giving her one little kiss, you lavish kisses on her because you're so madly in love with her. And that's what God does. He, he doesn't give us something small and little and just average, but he pours out a multiple blessing and lavishes, pours out an incredible amount of love unto us and calls us his children. This is who we are. We are the children of God. We are the children of God. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we have new life in Christ. We're not bound to sin anymore. The flesh has been crucified and we have new life. And we live by faith through Jesus Christ who loves us. In Jeremiah verses 29 and 11, we all know this. Well, if we're Christians and been Christians for a while, we know it. If you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, why don't you write this verse down and, and just meditate on these words. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you hope and a future. Wow. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for every one of us. God has a plan for me. And I've been living through a lot of the plans of God. And I tell you, it is the most wonderful, blessed experience that I've ever had. And I'm just overwhelmed at times with emotions and thankfulness to God that he chose me, that he had a plan that outweighed any idea that I ever had. And he's poured out his love and his goodness and his mercy and his everything into my life. And I, I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful that he has a plan to prosper me, a plan not to harm me. You, want, you need to know that God loves you intently and he does not want to harm you. Sometimes when things come and testings and trials come, we think, God, you know, you're punishing me. God doesn't want to harm you. He wants to give you a plan. He gives you hope and a future. John chapter 1 and verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Again, you're a child of God. If you received him, when you received him as Christ, Lord of your life, then you, you have become a child of God. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God has a will for a will and he has a plan and the plan for our lives gives him pleasure. And when we do what he's called us to do and we live a life in obedience and seek his face and seek his will, uh, when we do his plan, it gives him great pleasure. And, you know, when you please your father, children, if there's any children listening, when you please your father, you get reward. <laughs> you get reward. You don't please him for reward. That's not a good thing. But, you know, when you're just obedient to your father, fathers can't help but give good gifts to their children. The Bible talks about it. In Colossians chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness he is the head over every power and authority. Imagine that. Jesus is the head over every power and every authority. The Bible tells us that the name of Jesus was exalted high above all. He is the head of every power and every authority. And his spirit dwells in us. And we have Christ in us, in his fullness. In Romans 6 and verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the, the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Great scriptures. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Controversial in this time of world history. So God created mankind in his own image. In, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You've been created, whether you're male or female. Let's just leave it there at that point. You've been created in the image of God. Isn't that an incredible, wonderful thing to about to think that we are created in the image of God? In Galatians chapter 3, and verses 27 to 28. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, when we, when we become Christians, when we find our life in God, there's a real equal playing field and we all become just as valuable to God and the same to God. There, there are no special favorites with God. God loves all of us the same and God has a plan for all of our lives.
God doesn't just pick some special people and go, well, you're, you guys are going to have the incredible destiny and then you lot over there, you're not really worth anything. You won't get far at all. God doesn't think like that. God has an incredible plan for all of our lives. Yes, we're all gifted in different ways and our lives will be experienced in different ways and we, we're not all going to be superstars, but we are going to be able to do what God has called us to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 to 20, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were brought with a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Wow. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Again, it makes us realise who we are. One John chapter three and one to two. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and this is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been known, made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him, him as he is. You know, it, God sees us in a different way. And God looks beyond even our human physical being tonight, and, and he sees that time when Christ appears, when we are transformed into this incredible new spiritual being. I don't understand what it looks like yet, and I'm still working through some other things. But, you know, God has always such an incredible bigger picture of who we are. So why don't we tonight choose to let God's words tell us who we are? Let's meditate on the words of God and the scriptures that talk about how much God loves us and who we are in Christ and all of those things. Let's meditate on those and let's really believe on those things rather than let the world dictate to us who we should be. We can make a choice tonight, and I trust you will make this choice, because in this, making this choice will give you great freedom. When you see who you are in Christ and, and realise God's love in, for your own life tonight, it, it makes such a huge difference in the way we express our lives. And I want to thank you tonight for listening to this sermon. I think I've actually gone over time. I didn't mean to. I've been trying to make my sermon shorter, but, wow, I could have preached all night tonight just to encourage you that God has a great purpose and plan for you. God sees you in a different way. If you're down and downcast, feeling useless and worthless, the good news tonight is God sees you in a different way. You are precious to him. He loves you dearly, and there is new life in Christ for you, and there are destinies and purposes that you've never imagined, but they can be yours if you tap into God. Why don't we just pray and we'll finish with prayer. Lord God, tonight I thank you for this opportunity to speak. And I pray, Lord God, that this, this message will go into the hearts of people, that they will start to discover how wonderful you are, how much you love them so much. Your love is amazing love, Lord God, that you would love us when we were sinners and you love us when we're Christians and you continue to pour out your love in such a lavish, over-the-top way into our lives. And we thank you, Lord, that you already have thought out the purposes and plans for our life. And they're good plans and they're good things, Lord, and you want us to give us, to give us victory and success. God, help us to get a, a true understanding of who you are, that you are the God that can do all things and that when you speak something out into our lives, it's a guarantee that it's going to take place and that we can trust in you with the promises that you make into our lives. And we thank you, God, for your love and your grace and your mercy and all that you've done for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you guys tonight. Thank you for watching. I hope I didn't go too long. It's a bit longer than I'll try to be. But bless you, and I'll see you next week.